Hello, everyone. Welcome to Laser Focus. This is the deep dive pop culture podcast from Nerdist. My name's Kyle Anderson. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this week, we are going to be talking about uh, only a, a legend. Uh, nothing too major. Um, we were trying to figure out a time when that would be like most appropriate to talk about this person. Uh, and then we realized that it's never not the right time to talk about this person because uh, sure we could save it for Halloween because it's generally horror stuff, but like um, his name and like influence are so ubiquitous that we may as well talk about it now. And that person is of course, Stephen King, the um, I don't know, the best selling author of all time or something like that. Like, <laughs> like he definitely has the most books of any modern person. Uh, maybe Daniel. St- I haven't done any looking it's, uh, who don't please put your blackberries down <laughs> stop Black. trying i don't know what do people anyway um yeah that voice you heard is uh one of uh the most luminous horror minds in the game i don't know if that's true but uh she's my co-worker she's my friend and she is a big horror fan welcome please back to the show Allison Mattingly. Hi, Allie. Hi, thank you so much. I feel like you're overselling me on my my uh, prolificness in the horror world, but well, I do enjoy horror, and I do enjoy Stephen King. Yeah, it's inter- I was sort of like, I, I've never, I've, I've read a good amount of Stephen King. I won't say yeah. that I haven't. I haven't read anywhere close to all of Stephen King. So it's oh, kind of, no, it's like, it's like, am I an, like... I would say I'm a fan, but it's like, yeah. at what point do, do you have to know everything? Like, I'm not a completist when it comes to King, the way I am with oh, other yeah. authors. But, I mean, uh, well, like you said, he's written so much. Like, I oh, mean, yeah. I don't even know, like, how many, like, novels. And then you have the short story collections. Uh, I mean, he has several that he wrote under, you know, his, his pseudonyms. Mm-hmm. And is that the right word? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, like, I, I just... I remember at one point, like a couple, like over, like when the pandemic first started, I was like, I want to read like all the Stephen King books. <laughs> I looked at like a list and uh, that did not happen. Um, so, but I did read a few. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Um, and they're, you know, but some of them you look at and they're just, I mean, granted, he wrote quite a lot of them when he was on cocaine. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but like some of them are so big like it is such a huge book the book it is. is about it the clown it uh is such a big who's on first big, uh it um <laughs> but like the stand is also really huge yeah those were the two that i read during uh oh, really the pandemic yeah which I, I felt like the stand was just appropriate uh for that time totally um, totally i think i'm then, sure i think i actually remember hearing a lot of people reading the stand during covid just for that reason yeah like i remember like the libby app was like it it was a very long wait time if you wanted to get the audiobook for the stand so i i just ended up buying it on on audible but um but yeah those are like two massive massive books yeah. and yeah and, and there are several I, mean, I think under the dome is also a very long one mm-hmm. uh the 11 whatever the jfk assassination one is also oh, pretty uh... hefty one one two two six three, yes. Eleven twenty two sixty three. Yeah. Um, but it's it's interesting. So like he's always he's been since you and I have both been alive. He's been famous and well yeah. regarded. Um, but it feels like within the last five six years, like he's come back into huge prominence where people like who grew up reading his books are now reading or like making stuff out of his books and like we had yeah. that that whole Castle Rock series which was imperfect but like there's a really interesting idea of like yeah let's let's contextualize all of stephen king's oeuvre into (laughs) one town or one area Um, yeah first season was pretty good the second season i i don't think was as successful but yeah i watched like the first like episode or two of season two and yeah i wasn't really as into it but yeah i mean it's like he really has cultivated uh such a style and an atmosphere and i mean it's a very diverse style at the same time um you know his the range of his writing is is very you know in addition to just like qual- quantity mm-hmm. uh you know really like you know running the gambit from like you know 
very intense uh you know psychological horror uh and something more grounded like misery you have more out there uh stuff uh for poor or worse uh during uh especially i'm sure very very fueled by drugs uh like mm. you know <laughs> the lingleers uh and even it is a very um out there book uh especially um and you know but then at the same time you also have stuff like the green mile and shawshank redemption which right. are just fantastic uh you know obviously more short stories in uh a, a literary context but the movies are fantastic too uh which i guess is what we're primarily going to talk about today are movies but maybe not <laughs> i don't know yeah i mean certainly there's a lot of those the movies and um uh tv miniseries like he TV was the miniseries king. yeah back in the 90s i mean the langoliers you mentioned but like it was there and mm-hmm. um oh there was another big big one but there i, I can't remember offhand but there was that all started the with stands Sam. was the also stand you're right yeah. oh yeah that was a huge one in the 90s and the shining they did like a the more literary <laughs> adaptation of, weird uh yeah tv adaptation um which was actually filmed at the stanley hotel in colorado um, oh really i remember yeah it went when i was when, when that came out 94 i guess so i was 10 um my grandparents drove us up to estes park um when they were filming that just and we oh. couldn't like see but there were you know cameras and lights and stuff like that outside but that was as close as we could get but yeah um but yeah i, I mean you're right that, there yeah. has been a much uh like a really like big resurgence i feel like uh in the last like you know five to ten years uh because you know in the 2000s it was like it kind of died down like you got a few things but like uh i mean i feel like frank darabont was kind of like the stephen king guy for a while and Mm. now you have sort of like mike flanagan really leading the charge i feel like with a lot of he was i feel very responsible for uh the modern resurgence because i think his first one was uh gerald's game for netflix which is fantastic i really love that adaptation. really good yeah um but yeah then dr sleep uh he did uh 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 uh, gosh i mean he's he's working on a lot of stuff now he's working on the stand i would say that like um uh i guess there's another one coming out at some point tba but called uh the life of chuck which is a novella from a fairly recent (laughs) yeah um uh I think it's 2020. Yeah, it was in a collection from 2020. So yeah. very new. But he's also doing The Dark Tower as a, yes. as a series on Amazon. Um, and, and you could look at, I mean, Flanagan has been very open about the fact that King is a big influence on him. And it's very yeah. evident in his work. But you can look at um, Midnight Mass, oh which, my God, was, yeah. which was an original work of Flanagan's, but it's heavily influenced by a lot of different Stephen King things um it's taking place in the northeast also uh on like a secluded little town uh you know it's it's got a lot of salem's lot in and it's got a lot of Mm -hmm. um you know stuff about faith which is really big in in stephen king's work and oh yeah um so yeah i i found that really uh it looks like so like like you said in the 2000s we had a few kind of like breakout films uh, the best of, I mean, the, the mist certainly in 2007, oh, yeah. there was the mist, but there was also, uh, 1408, which I thought was good. It's not like the best movie ever made, but it's, I thought it was it's, quite good. Yeah. For the stuff coming out at the time, I think it was, it was one of the better ones. Um, certainly better than like Dreamcatcher or yeah, Secret Dream, Window. <laughs> yeah. Secret Window. I didn't like very much. Um, Dreamcatcher is just terrible. Um, yeah, yeah. But the, then you get, so, and then there's a couple other like pretty bad ones but then 2017 was a huge year because you had gerald's game as you mentioned we, there's the first it movie yeah which was riding on the success of stranger things um yeah. and so they they basically only focused on the the first part of the novel which is all about the kids or i guess chronologically the first part of the novel yeah um and then also to 1922 which isn't very good um or maybe it is very good actually i don't remember i don't think i ever saw that one um and then yeah, the dark think- tower film adaptation which is very bad <laughs> yeah that's why i'm hoping that mike flanagan can do a, a finally I, do that series justice <laughs> i think he will and i think that if anyone if anyone can, can. It's him. yeah yeah um i also liked in 2019 uh in the tall grass like netflix has had like a lot of really interesting like obscure sort of uh king 
adaptations mm-hmm. uh, in that period with with Gerald's Game and then uh, in the Tall Grass, and I believe nineteen twenty two was also in. Yeah, that was also um, yeah. But yeah, I really in the Tall Grass was an interesting one. Um, but uh, to me, the like where it all kind of came together i mean obviously it was was a really big one Mm -hmm. but dr sleep was such an interesting adaptation to me and where i really gained a lot of respect for mike flanagan not only as like just a general director but as like a stephen king adaptation ist Uh uh just because like i feel like that like he was given just like a super difficult task of adapting not only the novel which is like you know obviously a, a direct uh sequel to the book the shining but also warner brothers obviously wanted it to be a sequel to the stanley kubrick movie the shining which if you do not know is very different from king's mm. novel uh and so i really loved the way that he found a way to blend those two and adapt and stay faithful to king's novels both the the original and the sequel as well as the kubrick film which notoriously stephen king hated yeah. um and and made something that i believe king has said that he really enjoyed uh yeah he i mean there's some of that stuff like he said he liked the dark tower movie which there's no way he did but um <laughs> some of that stuff is he's being paid to do so but i i yeah. legitimately don't uh think he would lie about Mike a Mike Flanagan project um in that way and I I'm with you like so um in the lead up to that movie I actually got to do a lot of cool Dr. Sleep stuff which you can read oh, nice. uh on nerdist.com but like I got to when that movie was coming out I got to go to uh Estes Park it, to stay mm-hmm. at the Stanley Hotel interview Flanagan and then see what was essentially I think the premiere of the film oh, but nice. in Estes Park Colorado like with the locals and everything um, which was, I you know, huge. Cause that's, you know, the thing about the Stanley hotel is it itself is not haunted, but they have really <laughs> played up the fact that, Oh, this is the, the, you know, the shining thing. So they like, they give you ghost tours, but like uh, it has traditionally never been haunted. That was the whole point <laughs> of King's like staying there was like, it's the emptiness of the hotel. That's scary. Yeah. It's not that there's ghosts. It's that it's an empty old hotel. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so that I was like all in on that. So I I reread The Shining and then read Doctor Sleep, which I hadn't yet read, and was just like, oh boy, how is he going to adapt? All you know, because famously at the end of the book, um, yeah, the uh, <laughs> Overlook explodes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but at the end of the movie it remains, um, yeah. And so like they, you know, in the book they go to the place where the the mm-hmm. hotel was but in the in the movie they actually go to the hotel so and and it's a completely different type of movie like the yeah. shining is just about isolation and and uh you know creeping madness with you know supernatural elements and stuff like that but um the second one is like effectively an x-men vampire story <laughs> like yeah it's, it's like there are vampires who suck the mutant powers out of people with the shining and it's like that is such a strange concept yeah. um and i do i don't think it's like a I don't think it's an amazing. No, you know what? I, I I think it's a good movie. I think it's a good yeah. movie. I would have never. You, s- go ahead. So, uh, have you seen the director's cut? No, I haven't actually. I highly recommend the director's cut. It's right. very very good. I the pacing and everything I feel like is, uh, just so well done, and it feels much more like watching a King novel mm. uh in terms of that pacing and structure and everything. Uh if that makes sense. Uh yeah, yeah I always recommend people uh watch the director's cut. I, I think right. it's fantastic. I will I will do that. Um I have the I have it. I just yeah. haven't actually ever cracked it open. So um but yeah that was very much like a oh man we are in Stephen King's world and that was right around the time that yeah. Castle Rock was coming out. And so like mm-hmm. 2017 where there were four adaptations, 2019 there were uh, three or four adaptations because you also had uh, Pet Cemetery, which I <laughs> was not good, but it was no. another big Stephen King movie remake. It was, yeah. Um, I mean, like again, like I do, I appreciate in this time a lot of like the risks 
I mm. guess, uh, that people were taking with his work. Because I will say, like, I was very intrigued by, like, the trailers to the new Pet Cemetery when it revealed uh, that, you know, in that version, the opposite child died. Because mm-hmm. um, I think that that is, like, I love the original Pet Cemetery. It's it's one of my favorite King adaptations. Uh, but I do think you have the challenge of having such uh, a young character. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily. Like I'm fine with. <laughs> see, I was just I'm fine with killing killing young children. Um, in film, <laughs> isolate that. I'm I'm clipping that out. I'm isolating that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I'm fine with like the narrative like aspects of it. But I'm like, I am. I understand like the practical challenges of it from a filmmaking standpoint of having a character where like in the novel, it works really well to have, uh, I'm blanking on his name, uh, the young, the, the child in Gage, Gage. Uh, you know, in the novel, it works really well because, you know, it's a novel and, you know, you don't have to have a literal toddler uh, performing in Mm -hmm. the climax of the book. Whereas in the movie, you know, it's just not as effective with the limited acting talents of child. Um, And so I think having it be the older child, the daughter Ellie uh, in the new version was a really interesting and good choice to have. And it also plays a lot more with the themes of the novel and how her relationship uh, to her father and the concepts of death and everything. uh, It makes it a lot more interesting uh, and dynamic, I think it was just in the execution of it. It just really fell flat for me in the final yeah. movie. It wasn't. Yeah, it was very much a. Uh, I don't know, like an example of uh, you're do- you're doing all the things that a Stephen King adaptation should do, but it's yeah. like it, it just it lacked the sauce, I guess. You know, like mm-hmm. the, the kind of who knows what that. Um, <laughs> you know, and then I never watched the prequel. Um, Oh, Blood Pet Cemetery Lions. Bloodline. I have which not, comes yeah, out. I haven't watched it either. It's supposed to be very bad. Um, yeah, I but, just. I mean, it's a, it's such a creepy idea, and I'm with you. I think the Mary Lambert original is really good. Yeah. Um, and and definitely like, you know, it's still it's still that kind of like late '80s. I think yeah, late '80s or early '90s like schlock version of Stephen King. But yeah. she's able to. I mean, she's a very good director. Can elevate it to something a little bit more. Um, you know, thought provoking and stuff while you still have, you know, the mangled ghost kid who walks yeah. around and all that stuff. But um it's such a creepy idea. Like you bury stuff in here and it comes back, but it's, you know, it's it's messed yeah. up and stuff and something evil kind of comes back. And I love the line, you know, sometimes dead is better, which is just like, oh, oh sorry. Uh, that's, yeah. that's a classic line. Um yeah. It's definitely probably I don't know, it's so hard for me to pick a favorite novel. Um, but I mm. feel like Pet Cemetery is probably my favorite. Um, yeah, it's just such a great, chilling story. Mm. And that is what I feel like the original movie captured a lot more. Uh, cause that's, I don't know, like the new one, it just felt like it was trying to do too much in a way with like the, the kids walking around with the masks and stuff in the woods. Yeah. Like it just like... It felt like it was straying too far away from like what the original novel was trying to do and what made the original novel so effective. Uh, it just, I don't know. I, I am curious to see, to watch Bloodlines, um, but I just, I, I want them to make a really good, like, faithful adaptation. And like, even though I just said I like it when they take risks and, and take big <laughs> swings and stuff, I want you to see, like, not necessarily like uh you know it doesn't have to be exact but in terms of like the spirit of it like i yeah. love like just like I, I feel like that's when king is most effective is when it's just like really like just i don't know it just sits with you and like it just gets in your your bones mm. um but yeah i and that's uh Speaking of which, I, I will segue this to another one of my favorite uh, Stephen King adaptations, uh, which is Misery. Because um, mm. I feel like that's a similar sort of thing, where it's like, that is, like Pet Cemetery, the original movie, I think so effectively uh, executes that sort of, like, just really putting you into a situation 
introducing you to these characters and just letting you sit in this like uncomfortable mounting tension. You know, here's an interesting thing about Misery because they, um, I remember that movie coming out. It came out in 1990, and it was very. I mean, I was a child, so I didn't yeah. watch it. Um, <laughs> but I remember it being a big thing. Like it was, yeah. you know, won Oscars and stuff like that. Kathy Bates obviously won her Oscar for that movie, um, and is it is great. Like she is legitimately great in that movie. I watched it a few years ago when they put out like the anniversary Blu-ray of it or whatever. Yeah. And I actually don't think it's a very good movie overall. I think it's, I think it's, a, you know, and I've, that's one I've not read, so I can't compare and contrast or anything like that. I think the story is solid, but I think it's got, it makes some weird um, editing choices and the mm-hmm. pacing is very strange. And it just was sort of like, like the, the hobbling scene, which is infamous. Yeah. The next scene, he like, there's no sign of it. Like you could excise that whole sequence and it wouldn't change the movie at all. Yeah, that is. Uh, so like I, I, Misery was one of the books I read uh, as well over uh, 2020. And I will say that after reading it, it did change my perspective on the adaptation a lot more. Mm-hmm. Cause like before I would have said like Misery was my favorite adaptation. Uh, I mean, or just like my favorite Stephen King movie, but then having read the book yeah like there is a lot of that where it's like the book goes so really like really hard putting you in the mindset of of the uh james can character Mm -hmm. and it's like the half the horror is just really feeling his desperation and like his like there's like a whole scene where like he uh has to like go and uh try and get his like painkillers from the medic like from the bathroom while she's out um because he's just like so desperate for it and like you really feel the desperation in the book and yeah like i and then like i rewatched the adaptation afterwards and i was just like michael K- or, oh my god why am i calling my god uh, james can is just like seems fine like other than like he can't walk like his character seems totally like just very chill and like even after like you said like the hobbling scene it's just like there's no real like sense of like physical urgency or physical like struggle for his character and uh yeah and i i don't know if you knew this or not but like the the hobbling scene and it's like unique to the movie uh yeah i did know that she cuts off his his uh foot so it's like i do think that that was a really again an interesting change and a choice uh because i will say the hobbling scene is very like it'll make you you squirm yeah just Uh, as a scene it's like amazing and effective the fact that it's like you know uh you just see i mean it's all i'm a i'm a big like uh how how they do that gore effect guy um Uh, yeah, yeah and so like you know the feet are like you see her put the the log in between his actual feet and then they cut mm-hmm. to her i think and then they cut back to the wide shot and they're the fake feet and then she just does it and it's just as simple and, it, and the foot just goes clunk and like on a hinge and it's it's amazing and he screams in agony and it's like incredibly effective but then like then they cut to richard farnsworth again i think and then when they cut back to um james Conn, he's just sitting in the wheelchair looking out the window like smoking and like typing and it's just like so what was the point like yeah like so you still can't walk that's the ultimate thing is that like again if we would just cut that scene out it changes nothing about the actual film yeah which i think is a you know that's the mark of not particularly good pacing or not good mm-hmm. i don't know structure in some fashion so that was that was where i was kind of like surprised about also you know as i have seen the shining six million times yeah and i know this doesn't happen in the book but scatman crother spends the entire movie trying to get back to the overlook and then immediately gets killed that's yeah that's a stanley kubrick thing i think was a mistake because mm-hmm. i like that character and everything like that so that's not in excuse me that's not in the uh book however Misery, the movie, adapting the book, Richard Farnsworth spends the entire movie trying to figure out what's going on and where this guy went, and then she just immediately just kills him with a shotgun. It's like, what's yeah. the point? I can't stand stuff like that. I mean, there is... A, it, it does happen in the book. Uh, I'm trying to remember. It's been uh, it's a few years since I've read it, but it's like, I do remember, like, there is a cop that comes 
Uh, Because, like, I think it's not an exact, like, one-to-one adaptation with, like, that character. But there is a cop who comes uh, to, like, investigate. And uh, she ends up running him over with a lawnmower in the book. Oh, wow. So it's she's much more menacing, I feel like, in in the book. And much more of, like, a threat than... Mm. uh, I mean, not to to discount... um, Oh my god! I am blanking on so many names uh, today. Uh, who plays Annie in in the uh, movie? But Kathy Bates. Kathy Bates. Oh my god! I I'm usually so good with names. Uh, <laughs> famous names. I'm I'm a, I'm very bad when people introduce themselves to me. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, but yeah, sh- her character. She's very effective in the movie. But like in the book, like there's just like an extra level of like unhinged. Uh, unpredictability that they build up to Mm because yeah it is kind of anticlimactic when it's just like oh very quick like shotgun death to the cop in the movie but um and she's also like very terminator in the Uh in the book as well where it's just like it takes a it takes a good uh healthy beating uh and a lot of different like uh things to try and like finally take her (laughs) yeah and like there's so much more i mean even just kind of like glancing at the the plot synopsis of the book like she does a lot more like she cuts off paul's thumb and stuff like that she like really goes to town on him and then there's the the realization that oh she's killed a lot of people like yeah she's not this isn't like a new thing for her like she's actually like a pretty horrible um I think they kind of allude to it in the movie, but like they, they yeah, they died. Do remember them like going very in depth in the book mm. about like all the people she's killed? And like, she like keeps like a scrapbook of right. like of her victims. Um, and I think she's like notoriously like one of the big things was that she was like, I think killing babies. Like she was like a, a maternity ward nurse or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so like that was like her big like initial claim to fame that got her fired. Yeah, which they play up a little bit in in, uh, in Castle movie. Rock season two, and I actually do think that oh. what's um, uh, Lizzie Kaplan, who plays her a yeah. young version of Annie in the in the show, I think does a really good job. But is but is doing a Kathy Bates impression the whole time? Yeah. <laughs> like he, he <clears throat> she didn't get out of the cockadoodie car. Like it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, uh, hilarious as well. But um. I, what I find really interesting about that book is that most of Stephen King's books are somewhat autobiographical. Like, yeah. And I like the fact that that one was kind of based on, he had written the eyes of the dragon, which is a, a like a fantasy novel mm-hmm. just, and, and people were angry at him that it wasn't a, wasn't a horror book. And, and so he's just like, so this is my one thing that I do. And like, you know, <laughs> yeah. but it feels really like, you know, that the movie came out in 1990 and you're like, Oh wow, obsessed fans are terrible or and and yeah. uh but how many like people today are like with various franchises I could name but won't yeah. are like entitled to what they want mm-hmm. and so like they get really annoyed if or or even like belligerent and stuff like if that doesn't yeah. happen. I feels like boy, he was really on the cutting edge of that stuff. Oh yeah. Um and was this I can't remember did the novel come out before or after his like real life car crash? That is a good question. I um, think because I thought like originally too, like he's spoken about how like the novel is is meant to be like a uh, more so like a metaphor, like Annie is a metaphor for his addiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I can't remember if the car crash happened uh, before or after the novel came it out. It was after. Uh, it was after. It was 1999 is the car crash. Oh yeah. Um. So that is interesting too, because yeah, he was kind of laid up there for a while. Yeah. Um. Yes. Okay. So let's. <laughs> I want to talk about. Um. Like we were already kind of talking about our our favorite adaptations, but I kind of want to go chronologically through some of those some of the bigger ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So f- like right out of the gate, you have Brian De Palma's Carrie, which yeah. is a great movie. Yeah. Um. A really upsetting movie, and maybe like. I mean, it's up. It might be De Palma's best movie. Like, I'm not a huge De Palma fan. I find him yeah. really interesting, but I also find him very flawed and uh, kind of irritating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just admit you're ripping off Hitchcock. Just we know you're doing it. Have you, did you ever see that documentary um, where it's just Noah Baumbach talking to him at a table? No. Um, it's really. Inter- I mean, it's you know, it goes film by film. Uh, oh, it's okay. just the two of them talking and stuff. But like, you know, Baumbach brings up like 
you know, there's a lot of Hitchcock in your movie. And he's like, I think we were all uh, inspired by Alfred Hitchcock at the time. And it's like, no, you legitimately just ripped off Hitchcock, like point for point in some cases. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But Carrie, I think, is outstanding. And yeah. as an adaptation of King's first book, uh, first novel, it's, yeah. it's um, I think, you know, that book is not like as in depth as and uh as a lot of his later stuff would be and so i think it's a little easier to adapt it as a as a straightforward film um but i do think he does like a really uh really great job with it actually king's first three novels all got made into something because salem's lot was the second book but it got made into a uh tv movie miniseries yeah miniseries legitimately could just be a feature length movie there's a lot of faff in that miniseries nothing really happens until the end of the first part yeah (laughs) but Um, i mean like yeah yeah that's yeah that's it but like all of them like have such like iconic like even if like the overall like whole of them aren't like are debatably like of debatable quality but like yeah like carrie the shining and salem's lot are like three like very like iconic adaptations like right out the gate yeah so like to have that in both mediums is is really interesting absolutely and i think like by that point, it was like we were off and running, you know, like yeah. 80, 83 alone, you had Cujo, The Dead Zone and Christine. And I actually yeah. think it, for what they are, all three of them are really good. Oh, yeah. Cujo um, is fantastic. I mean, yeah. like, you know, it's a very like, I don't know, you, you think like, how do you make this work for a feature like mm-hmm. film? But like, I, I I feel like it's still like I rewatched it like a, a year or so ago and it's still a very effective movie. Yeah, and I I guess I missed Creep Show, which I love. I love Creep Show. Oh, Creep Show, so uh, and it does adapt a couple of his short stories. But um, he he wrote the screenplay for it, and he's yeah. in it, and it's a very yeah. silly section of the book, but or the film, but uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, Cujo, I think is the, it's definitely the one of those three that I've seen the least. Um, but I don't think it's not for lack of it being like I don't enjoy it. Like I think it's a really tense and uh, effective movie and it just you feel the heat of that movie like they're just sitting in this car roasting to death because it's the 70s or the early 80s and the car is old and they don't have good air conditioning and yeah whatever and um lewis teague directed that one um who's uh he directed also cat's eye but also uh alligator which is a movie i really love (laughs) oh nice um but then yeah the dead zone by cronenberg which is like cronenberg is like least or at least for the time, like a very restrained film for Cronenberg. Yeah. Um, kind of a strange choice because, like, right after that, he would make The Fly, and right before that, he made Videodrome, <laughs> or maybe that the same year Videodrome came out. Yeah. Like it's it was like oh wow yeah right. same year same year um and then Christine of course which was uh I think the novel was written while they were like in tandem with the screenplay and then um Carpenter made that because starman had done no not starman uh the thing had done Mm. so poorly so he wanted to make something a little more um mainstream commercial yeah um and i i like christine i think i could you know there's a lot of good in christine um i think of those three uh dead zone i think is the clear like i don't know champagne (laughs) stephen (laughs) king movie um i mean like i i I prefer kusho but that's mm. just me like i said i i I really love a stephen king movie or or story where it's just like simple scenario and just letting you sit in it Mm. which i don't know maybe that's just yeah i mean i do think that that's what some of his best stuff is is just you know gerald's game is a movie or is a book that like most people thought could never be a movie because it's literally just a woman thinking to herself. Yeah. But it's um, so effective. It's the movie's so amazing. Good. Yeah. But uh the scene with the handcuff. Ugh. Oh. Oh, she's cut. Oh, it's oh. if you've not seen Gerald's game, it's on Netflix. Please watch it. It's excellent. So good. Carla Gugino, uh, the ghost of Bruce Greenwood, and <laughs> the guy who played Lurch, and also the whatever, the fireman in uh Twin Peaks. That guy. Whatever. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Carl Stroiken. Yeah. Um <laughs> Really interesting uh, movie, but anyway. Um, but, but yeah, uh, then yeah, going into the later eighties, we have Children of the Corn, uh, which is yeah. Children of the Corn is the one that's turning forty this year, which is kind of what prompted this, this oh, whole yeah, yeah, discussion. Yeah. So, Children of the Corn, I think, is not a good movie, um, but it's also great. <laughs> like, yeah. I think uh, that's when we start to really get into like the camp, yeah, era, yes. <laughs> um. And people really start like 
um, you know, given they're like, ah, we know what this is. Like they're not as faithful. They don't kind of takes the text quite as much as, yeah. um, as you know, like as gospel as it were, I guess. Um, so there's so much about the movie that just leaves out what's really interesting about the story, which is like all the weird Lovecraftian stuff, which yeah. is in a lot of his work, um, <laughs> which I love. I think a few years ago, maybe around the time it came out, I wrote a whole piece about the Lovecraftian influences on Stephen King. And so I was going like, what are the outer gods and King's work that are in Lovecraft? And that was really fun, oh. <laughs> I have to say. But <laughs> there's that the the entity in the corn that the children worship yeah, um, is just not particularly well like shown in the film i mean i feel like that was the challenge of like yeah. early king adaptations uh i mean even today like i feel like there's a really it's just so hard that like that specific component of horror from like a novel medium is just it's so difficult to to translate that's why it i feel like you know the new ones really did their best and like mm-hmm. made it m- more effective than I think the uh, Tim Curry version for like the finale. But like, yeah, it's just those like his like concepts with that more cosmic Lovecraftian horror are just like, I feel like where it gets really difficult to adapt to a screen format. Um, Yeah. And like, you know, I think the first, I mean, this is jumping the gun, but I think the first it feature film, is Mm -hmm. is good like i think it's quite good i think the second one really suffers from because that's the less interesting part of the novel and it's like let's make a whole movie of the stuff where they're just shitty adults um yeah i (sighs) who basically have to go through the same scares as the first movie like yeah i just i like i i do like it part two i would like to see like a version that is like maybe like half an hour to 45 minutes shorter completely agree there yeah um and yeah it's like i don't know at the time i really liked part one and that it, they they made that decision to do like entirely focus on them as kids but also like i think part of the reason why like you said it's like all the adult stuff is like the least interesting so it's just like i feel like maybe you needed to blend it throughout more um for both movies rather than just like pushing it all to part two Mm. and then like weaving in like a little bit of extra kid stuff where it's like okay we kind of are like it's like yeah like i I appreciated seeing like the richie flashbacks and stuff like that but then like okay but why didn't we we saw this already in part one like essentially like in terms of like that same sort of like narrative beat yeah and there were some bits that i thought were legitimately you know andy muschietti is an interesting director Um, yeah he gets a lot of that like the moment to moment stuff like i <clears throat> but you know i i definitely think that there was a lot in uh part two that just was like we saw this one already yeah. like i will you know. say that the cast saves it like i you know the oh, casting yeah. is so perfect on the adult counterparts mm-hmm. that i really enjoyed just like seeing them and watching them interact and stuff and i i love bill Hader. i could watch him do anything oh yeah and he he was you're absolutely right he's the perfect choice for that and and way better than like just i be i know people like tim curry as pennywise and i think yeah. it's like he's uh, you know rightfully iconic and it scared the crap out of us when we were little kids but yeah um i think in terms of the rest of the cast like harry anderson come on like i like harry anderson on night court <laughs> i think he's, he's very effective and good comedy ma- magician but like i i just never bought like you know who else who else is in that Oh, as the doll. I think Annette O'Toole was the was what's her face, and then um I know Seth Green was young Richie. Yeah, was the young Richie. Um, um but yeah, it's still it was um very forgettable cast, I feel like, yeah. other than Tim Curry. Yeah. Hoo ha, hoo ha, hoo ha. Um and the opening scene of the oh. of the TV movie, uh, uh come in georgie we all float down oh, like it's God. great that yeah. stuff is so Scarred good me as a child my sister yeah of tricked course me into watching it terrifying clown it's the reason people it's not the reason people are scared of clowns um it doesn't help yeah or, no, i no, guess no, no. what well, helps make you more afraid of them i don't know it doesn't yeah. hurt i don't know what i'm trying to say <laughs> what are you trying to say i don't know most of the time i don't know <laughs> i'm just kidding um yeah uh, 
But yeah. So getting back uh, to 84, the other one that came out in 40 years ago was Firestarter. Oh, which, yeah. So here's the thing about the, the movie Firestarter. I can see, because that was going to be John Carpenter, but because oh. of, I think they were still unwilling to give, Universal was unwilling to give him money for it because the thing had lost them a lot of money. Oh. And so they... Mark L. Lester ended up being the director and he was, uh, he, you know, he did, uh, the class of 84, which is like a weird, um, like post-apocalyptic ish kind of movie about how, about like a, a school overrun by gangs and stuff like that. It's not a good movie. Oh. <laughs> um, but like, I can see when watching the movie Firestarter, what, how it would have been better if King had, or uh, if Carpenter had directed it. And it, it makes me kind of like it because like it was still, um, it had the kind of general vibe of a Carpenter movie without it actually being a Carpenter movie. <laughs> so uh, also Tangerine Dream did the music to it. Um, oh. So I don't necessarily stand by the movie because, you know, I, I think uh, George C. Scott, who I love, is playing a Native American tracker in the movie, and oh that is God. not okay. I have not seen that movie in forever. That is, yeah. uh, that's uh, Drew Barrymore, though, right? In the right yeah, she plays yeah. the titular fire starter. Yeah. Have you seen, did you see the, uh, they did a remake last year with Zac Efron? Uh, um, I didn't see dad. it because I heard it was awful. I would say I, I did not see it either after I saw the reviews for it, but I, I was curious. I, I don't know. <laughs> I yeah. That's that's the thing with the uh, the Stephen King adaptations. I feel like it's like uh, what's the saying in Game of Thrones with like the Targaryens, where it's like you flip a coin. <laughs> it's either oh yeah, yeah. Honestly, <laughs> that's true, and that, that's something that's absolutely worth mentioning because there were so still a ton of King adaptations in in you know the nineties. And some of them were pretty good and some of them were not. And yeah. but when they weren't good, they were very, very bad. It's not like yeah. there's like a, you know, a lot of pretty good or just okay Stephen King adaptations because yeah. like if we look at feature films, obviously we had Misery, but that same year Graveyard Shift came out, which is <laughs> currently has a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, um, I understand that's an old movie, but like, you know, yeah. uh, and then you had in 92, The, uh, the Lawnmower Man. Oh, uh, we did skip over man. Stand by me and Stand by uh, me. the and the Running Man both came out yeah. in the mid '80s, and those are good. Yeah. Um, d- uh, the Running Man, directed by Paul Michael Glazer, who played Starsky on Starsky and Hutch. That's just a fun fact. Oh, well, well. Um, but Stand by Me is excellent, and and the Running Man with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is fun. But anyway, so yeah. then you have the Graveyard Shift, which is awful, and then you had Lawnmower Man in '92. Which they really changed a lot to try to make it like virtual reality. And oh weird. yeah, and, you, you gotta know, get, you gotta just, get into the future. Those right. those graphics, uh, the CGI in that movie. Just and then in ninety, it's true. I mean, it is something else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Jeff Fahey's actually pretty good as the <laughs> as the titular lawnmower man, but like uh, uh, Pierce Brosnan. I, like is he a good i don't i look i don't want to disparage i think he's a good james bond but in so many other things i'm like what is he doing um uh 93 you have the dark half george, george romero's the dark half which i actually think is quite good oh i don't think um, i've ever seen that one it's good yeah it's um it's based on a story of the same name but it's it's essentially um timothy hutton plays uh an author who writes this evil character who is who ends up being actualized and it's literally his like evil side of himself and it's it's oh. a you know it's very much what you'd expect a stephen king story yeah. to be like sounds almost like secret window it's kind of, yeah it is kind of like secret window actually it's better i mean it's better than secret window yeah yeah <laughs> um and then needful things which is a good book but uh, oh, yeah, i don't yeah. i don't remember the movie but i remember people thinking it it wasn't good yeah um then we have the shock redemption you know, which is one right. of my favorite uh king movies it's i think that is the gold standard for like i mean it's obviously not a horror horror story but like i mean a movie that didn't In do very way. well uh at the time like financially yeah uh got passed over a lot for oscars because that was a big that was a stacked year for oscars um losing out oh, to yeah. forrest gump as everything did that year um <sighs> And then it, it's on TNT 100 times a day. 
<laughs> yeah, that's like I was gonna say. I was like, that's like a movie. It's like one of those movies, like that, like Goodfellas. It's like when I yeah. have access to cable, if like if I'm in a hotel or something, and I see the Shawshank Redemption's on, I'm gonna stay up until like one a.m. watching it. Uh, yeah, it's just like one of those movies. It just sucks you in, no matter what part of the movie it's in or whatever. I don't have to catch it from the beginning. I'll like drop it halfway through. I'm gonna finish that thing. Yeah, I mean, and you can't like. Uh, yeah, you can't just uh, stop watching that movie. No. It's it's a movie that like I've seen from the beginning a couple times, but I've watched it from the middle a million times. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, um, it's just so so great. Uh, the cast is great, um, and yeah, I feel like it's like that era of like King where it's like starting to get into like a little bit more of like the prestige. Like you said, it didn't win any Oscars, but then you have like the green mile coming out a few years later. Yeah. Um, that's just also very fantastic. All yeah. Also Frank Darabont also in that same kind of vein prison related, great depression ish. And, yeah. uh, um, Michael Clark Duncan is outstanding in that movie. I think, oh, yeah. he, I think he got a Oscar nom for that. I think I'm pretty sure he did. Um, he should have, if not, should have. Yeah. Um, and then like Toby Hooper's the mangler, which is terrible. <laughs> um, and also Dolores Claiborne, which is really kind of another oh, highbrow, yeah. like more thrillery than horror, but like the book is quite horror, but, um, you know, Taylor Hackford directed that one, um, who is, you know, a well-known director. Yeah. Um, and then 97, they did the night flyer, which is, <laughs> um, I think it was a TV movie. Oh, no. It's, no, it's, it's, it's a feature film. Line. Yeah. Um, about a vampire on a plane. <laughs> it's a weird movie. It's definitely Tad a weird movie. these vampires on this plane. Yeah, but very small planes. Like a, a really tiny. It's really bizarre. It's such a strange. It feels <laughs> almost like it should have been a Tales from the Crypt episode. But uh, it's yeah, not. Yeah. Like it's that level of just like um, Miguel Ferrer plays a a tabloid reporter which is a very tales from the crypt profession um and who goes to the small airport and there's a vampire who flies a cessna <laughs> like it's so strange um and also uh, the vampire has like a big cape um and is like strange looking it's a very very weird movie it's often on sci-fi channel so i would, I would oh, recommend okay oh, so i've never um, seen this but now i kind of want to <laughs> And then 98 was Apt Pupil, which um, is a psychological film about a Nazi in a basement, uh, oh. directed by someone who sucks. Um, <laughs> uh, and then The Green Mile. And then Hearts in Atlantis, which is sort of like an a weird offshoot story of The Green or uh, not The Green Mile, uh, of The Dark Tower. Oh. Um, like it connects to, I became obsessed in college. I still have never read a single dark tower novel, but I became yeah. obsessed with how the other characters and, and novels in King's, uh, bibliography connect to the dark tower. Yeah. And Hearts in Atlantis is one of them. Yeah. I, I also, I've not read, I've only read the first dark tower, uh, years ago, but, uh, I do, like, I remember whenever I was reading, uh, Salem's Lot, uh, in 2020, mm. and I was like, oh, whatever happened, like, wait, did we find out what happened to the, um, uh, the priest character? And I read that he shows up in Dark Tower, uh, in, in the yep. series. Um, and yeah, and then, uh, isn't, uh, isn't Rick Flagg from The Stand's the man in black Randall flag Randall flag Rick flag Rick flag is from comic books oh sorry sorry yeah Randall flag uh isn't he also in the the dark tower series isn't he like the main antagonist or... yes he is he's the man in black essentially is, is yeah Randall flag yeah um who is essential i think i think i kind of equated him to the lovecraft character nyar lathotep who is literally the black man of evil or whatever um uh, yeah. which lovecraft as you might expect <laughs> he's a little more racist about it, but, yeah. um, but he's sort of like, he's a, he's an outer God and also, but is like the most directly tied to humanity and like needs to, you know, like can walk among them and stuff like mm. that. I find, I find that kind of stuff really interesting. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, he's, he, yeah, he's the main character. He's the main antagonist is the same character from the stand. And then. Uh, I used to remember all this stuff, but like Hearts of yeah. Atlantis, they made into a film, even though it is the book itself is a tie in novella from uh, the Dark Tower. <laughs> the Dark Tower. It's called Low, Low Men in Yellow Coats. 
huh. which is a Dark Tower tie-in. Wow. Um, Dreamcatcher, we already talked about, is terrible. Uh, <laughs> Secret Window is not good either. No. Uh, Riding the Bullet is another Mick Garris one. Um, oh, yeah, I don't remember that one. Mick Garris basically was the, the, the de facto king director of TV movies. He did The Shining. He did. Oh, uh, okay. Um, let me see if uh, television adaptation. Does it even say? Come on, man. It doesn't say he directed half of these, but um, Mick, Mick Garris, who is a, you know, a pretty well-known horror aficionado and, yeah. and director, directed a lot of those. I, did he direct the It uh, TV movie? No, he didn't. No, that was Tommy Lee Wallace, uh, who directed Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Oh, oh wow. Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of of TV movies based on his work. So there was like yeah. golden years, the stand, the Langoliers, Langoliers. they made the shining, uh, oh. storm of the century, Rose red. I've heard really good things about Rose red. I believe Rose red is basically his Hulu. Yeah. I would, I would recommend watching it. Rose red is, is his, the haunting. It's, it's pretty oh, okay. interesting. Um, uh, kingdom hospital, which was an adaptation of the kingdom, which is the large von Trier, um, Oh, uh, TV series about a haunted hospital. Um, okay, Desperation, which is a uh, about an evil sheriff <laughs> who's somehow yeah. a vampire or something. I forget. Um, several episodes of Under the Dome he wrote. Um, oh yeah, yeah, Under the Dome. And That's then there have been other adaptations of like whole. You know, they've they've done several like TV movies of his. Uh, like uh, dreamscapes and whatever yeah. nightmares and dreamscapes, which was a like a anthology series that they made for a while. Yeah, um, like, they've tried to adapt Salem's Lot a couple of times as a TV miniseries. Right. Yeah, that, I think yeah, the one in the early two thousands had Rob Lowe in it. Yeah, which, Rob Lowe. Yeah. <laughs> um, they made sometimes they come back. The Tommy Knockers. The Tommy Knockers was the other one I was thinking of. That was like uh, big, yeah, yeah. big news when that came out in on ABC. Um, trucks. Oh yeah, we do. Let's talk a little bit about um, uh, maximum. Oh, maximum overdrive. overdrive. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which was based on his story. Trucks about yeah. <laughs> cars and things that come to life and try to kill people. Yeah, and he he di- That's the one movie he directed, and he was so high on cocaine the oh, entire oh, yeah. time. And that movie is. You can feel it. <laughs> yeah, you can feel the cocaine, like just the cocaine sweats are part of the film green, <laughs> and it's so strange. It is iconic because the the main evil truck has a green goblin face on the yes. front, which is awesome. But like, it's so strange that Marvel allowed that to happen. I guess it was the late '80s, and Marvel yeah, was fairly needed money, strapped for cash, right? <laughs> um, uh, that's uh, Emilio Estevez is the yep. main character in that right yeah yeah that's correct yeah um such a wild uh movie um um, i was trying to see who else was in it uh uh, pat hingle who played commissioner gordon in the uh first no the four the the burton movies and the schumacher movies uh yardley smith of the simpsons was in it oh that's right that's right oh my god (laughs) Oh, and also it was weird because it uh, it had a bunch of songs. Uh, ACDC, the, right? The ACDC, the yeah. entire soundtrack was ACDC, which was King's favorite band. Uh, and the song Who Made Who, and which is also one of their albums, was the soundtrack to Maximum Overdrive. Oh. <laughs> it's so weird. Uh, and Hell's Bells and You Shook Me All Night Long are not on that album, but they are on that soundtrack. <laughs> uh so bizarre so such great. a strange movie but there's but i also kind of like love it you know like oh it's, yeah it's of the period where like they weren't good movies but i kind of love them no i think it's like again like there are some like king movies that fall in that like so bad they're good category mm-hmm. uh where it's just like so over the top and like there is some like really like like good gore or like good vile like good violence some good uh good carnage in that movie too like i think a lot of it got censored uh but like the uh this was it was it a steamroller or like uh that like smushes the kid yeah 
I think it is a steamroller. Boy, it's been a long time since I've seen that movie. Yeah, but... it's been a minute since I've seen it too. But yeah, I just remember there's some like good stuff. <laughs> there's like a soda machine that throws <laughs> soda cans at people. <laughs> <laughs> Which they, I think in one of the Transformers movies, they they like use that whole bit. Like oh, really? somebody like, there's like a, is it the second one? I can't really remember, but there's like a, a virus that can turn any machine into a transformer, which is ridiculous. Oh, I think that is the second one because I've only seen like the first two and I do remember that. So yeah, the second one uh, was made while the first or not the first, but the uh, the last writer strike was happening. Yeah, and so there's just a lot of dumb in that movie because there was no one around to tell they Michael know Bingo. and there was nobody or nobody actually around to rewrite the script so he just made up stuff i mean um but is that not how the rest of the transformers movies are again i have not seen them i did see bumblebee i did like bumblebee but uh the other yeah, bumblebee Bay is transformer pretty... movies are from what i have seen of them seem very questionable <laughs> uh yeah it's I don't know. uh <laughs> anyway those movies that's, that's i was gonna say that's a whole different tangent. podcast but i actually don't want to talk about them yeah yeah fair um <laughs> but uh uh back to the 2000s uh yeah. of of king movies we finally in 2007 was a good year we got uh four, 1408 and the mist mm-hmm. yeah um, and the mist the mist really has stood the test of time and, oh, and yeah. actually changes the ending of the short story because mm-hmm. the short story is very ambiguous and Darabont just decided, I mean, he, he's the trifecta of, of King adaptations. This is yeah. his third. Uh, and boy, it oh, just like so destroys good. you and it's so good. Yeah. So, and it, yeah. So effective. If you've had the opportunity to see the black and white cut, yeah. um, it's somehow better. And I don't know yeah. why it's very, I love, yeah. I love watching that movie in black and white. Um, yeah, I love it again. Just like, I know I've said it like 10 times now, but like, simple setup single mm-hmm. location just letting these characters like stew in in the like tension and you know you got some like hallmark uh king tropes with like the the religious themes you have these like lovecraftian monsters uh you know you have human monsters that mm-hmm. are just so good so good and you have the ambiguity of like since they don't know what these creatures are, or where they're coming from, mm-hmm. you have, you know, um, Mrs. Carmody is yeah. one of the best villains King ever wrote. And I think Marsha Gay oh, Harden yeah. plays the living hell out of that role, but who's basically like, this is God's, you know, wrath upon you. And you are the, you know, mm-hmm. the, the infidels or what no, I shouldn't say infidels, but, um, and people start believing her and it's like how, how quickly people kind of succumb to that kind of fear mongering. And we're seeing, yeah. you know, that's another thing we see very easily today where people just are like, they don't have answers for stuff. And so they turn yeah. to the most irrational people because there is no actual rational. They can't rationalize what's actually yeah. happening. I do love the read though, that like, that is like somewhat like of a ambiguous question at the end, because like, you know, her whole thing was that they needed to sacrifice the kid in order to make it stop. And then it stops. It ends when he kills everybody in the car. So it's like, sorry to yeah. spoil it. Um, yeah. But <laughs> you know, it's like, did, was she right? Did, did killing the kid end it or, you know, so it's like, yeah. I, I've seen readings of it. Uh, online that like kind of bring that up and I'm like oh that's kind of interesting yeah um, but yeah I, I love it's, the mist it's so good and I, I it's been way too long since I've watched it they recently just put that out on uh, 4k like upgraded stuff yeah so I remember, I've been meaning to pick the the 4k up because yeah I, I have like a digital version of it on yeah. voodoo which as we know is uh, permanent and the best yeah. way of, of owning media that's the um, only way yeah we, <laughs> If you don't have it in your possession, that's the best way to actually have stuff. Yeah. Um, but you, uh, I, I did want to, I, I wanted to talk about 1408 real quick. Cause I know you said this, you really enjoyed this movie. It's been a I long time since I've seen it, it when it came out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's so yeah. It came out the same year as the mist. It's, it's much less, but you know what? On Rotten Tomatoes, it has a better score than the mist. And I think that's just really, a, I think the mist, uh, rubbed people the wrong way. Uh, 1408 uh, is a real straightforward haunted hotel kind of where it's about a writer played by John Cusack who 
whose agent I think is um, Sam Jackson. Who no, Sam Jackson did, is the uh, the hotel owner. Oh, that's right. You're right. Um, who basically he in order f- to write like a, a haunted. book about uh, about haunted places, he goes and stays at this hotel, stays in the haunted room 1408, um, which is an, a, a fun kind of like nod back to The Shining because The Shining is about a haunted room. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the book it's 217, in the movie it's 237, but. Um, and that, you know, when you go to the Stanley Hotel, that's the most coveted room. That's the one that everybody um, wants to stay in is 217 because that's the Shining Room. Do they have the uh, bathtub? You, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like that room has to be better than all the other rooms. Like, Oh, yeah. I would imagine, like, you go all out to, like, replicate that room, I would, yeah. I would assume. <laughs> You'd imagine so. I mean, like, the room that I stayed in was... Uh, was done three so it was like down the hallway it's not a big hotel i don't know if you've ever been there it's not no i haven't Uh, i want to it's got a really opulent ballroom and you know there's a cool it has a uh a a dedicated whiskey bar with like say how's the bar it's great oh boy (laughs) that place was awesome like the menu of whiskeys that you could order from this place was like it's like a, a pamphlet unto itself it was amazing um anyway so um and it feels old, like it's kind of you know the yeah. they've kept it really um, uh, vintage, but the room is you know it has an old timey bed. It's got carpeting that is kind of gross, and it's just oh like it was an interesting sort of thing. And it was freezing cold because we went in uh, November before well, the, the movie boiler's came out. broken. So. That's right. <laughs> Maybe they did that on purpose. They're <laughs> like, what if the room was absolutely freezing but like and every room has a radiator in it instead of actual heaters like it's just old. Uh, it's just an old place but anyway um so i would i would be very surprised to hear that um uh they renovated just that one room (laughs) although who knows um that's the one everybody wants to stay in but yeah so 1408 it's like it's like him uh again doing a a uh reaction to his own kind of mythos essentially Um, cause that short story came out in 99, which is obviously well after yeah. he, uh, um, wrote the shining and everything like that. And yeah. you know, just the, the mythos around the shining kind of grew. I'd be, I really want to rewatch that now that I'm like, we're talking about it. Cause like, I remember like in middle school, like when it came out, like I, you know, when I was first starting to like really get into horror, I went and rented it with some friends, uh, one night from blockbuster. And it was like, I remember watching it and you know, it was, I, I was like, yeah, that's fine. But like, uh, I'd be curious to watch it now. Um, as, yeah. But yeah. I, and like I said, like, I don't, I saw it one time. I think I watched it on cable or something like that after it came out. And I was just, you know, this is pretty good. Um, yeah. And it, um, I think just as, you know, solid ghost story kind of thing. It like with, with, um, the elements that King always includes, especially with his writer characters of like mm-hmm. growing madness and <laughs> feeling trapped in a place and just like, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, that was the, the era of, I don't know, feel like, uh, pull the rug out horror movies. Cause there was also, uh, yeah. I mean, another John Cusack movie was identity from a few years before that, which uh, yeah, yeah. is a, is a pull the rug out kind of movie. Very, yeah. Uh, like, trippy uh yeah pull the rug out twist ending yeah that was a really big time for twist endings uh in movies i mean even the mist is kind of a i mean it's not twist yeah. it's a swerve but it's, it's, swerve, it's an interesting yeah. ending because i mean that, that was also like i feel like peak Shyamalan. uh yes it was at that time because i think like the village came out that year um also did is it or right? was that earlier I think 2007 might have been uh, Lady in the Water. Lady in the Water. That's the one that came out in 07. That's right. A Village, I think, yeah. was 06. And then, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. And then Signs was before that. Uh, yeah. I think. Look. Signs was, I have the internet Science in front was of like me, but... 02, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lady in the Water. Children. Paul that was 2006. So r- right around the same time. But um, Okay. Okay. But yeah. Anyway. That was, yeah. anyway. Regardless. It's a. Uh, <laughs> It was definitely that period of time. You're absolutely right. I always forget about the Shyamalan influence and how much. I mean, because even Secret Window is a twist ending. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, not a, yeah. it's a twist ending you see coming a million miles away. But, but um, it's, yeah, it tries to have it. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a thing about, like, Stephen King writes so much. And mm-hmm. a, a, you just, not, you know, full-length novels, but, like, also writes a ton of, ton of short stories. Yeah. Not every one of those is going to be amazing. No. And, like, um, but then you have 
people making them because it's got Stephen King's name. And so like he, yeah. you know, he's not above doing weird twist endings. And so yeah. like Well, especially it's like with those like shorter like novellas or short stories, it's just like you're trying to adapt a short story into a feature length film. It's like I haven't watched it yet, but I know like the boogeyman that just came out last year. Is, have you seen yeah. it? Is I it, did. Yeah. Is it good? I didn't really like it. Um uh but I really like the short story. That's it. The short story is amazing. Yeah, and and so little of the of the movie is the short story. Like, yeah, the scene in which the you know because if you haven't read the short story, it's about uh, a father who goes to a um, psychiatrist, kind of out of the blue, just walks in uh, and starts describing this ordeal he's been going through with this you know, this creature, this boogeyman creature mm. that lives in the dark of his house and everything like that has been terrorizing his family and like, I think even killing his family and just yeah, like he's, doing he's bad, bad kids. stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, and then like the kind of thing in that story is that he thinks that he's in a safe space, but he's not like, it's mm. one of those. Um, that's only such a small part of the movie. Yeah. And then the rest of it is the psychiatrist's family going through the net. Like he's passed it yeah. on to him and stuff. And it's just like, ah, you know, like it just didn't do much for me. And also like, I, I know I might be kind of alone in this or whatever, but like, I thought the movie smile was tremendous. I really I liked still it. I've not seen smile. It's, you know what? I thought it was really, really effective. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot of stuff in, in the boogeyman that feels derivative Mm -hmm. uh, of other movies like smile or something like that, where there's a creature and there's, you know, yeah. something kind of, uh, latching itself onto a person or a family and kind of just, you know, whatever. And it's, I, I thought the creature design was a little too close to like, um, a quiet place for me, like not to spoil what the creature looks like in the boogeyman. Oh, but I like, think I did see a photo of it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I did see a photo of what the, the creature looks like. And the whole, I mean, the thing about the boogeyman idea that makes it so scary is that it's, weirdly sentient it's not just a, mm -hmm. a monster you know it's not just a beast oh yeah it's and like I, tormenting the guy in the, in right. the book or in the, in so the, it's like it's just like it was you can't you can't have it both ways where like so it's a beast that's like yeah. lives in the shadows but then it's also like and then cobweb did you see cobweb last year no cobweb is a mess but uh <laughs> it does a lot of the same stuff that boogeyman also did yeah. except well, that one does have like a there's a girl in the wall who you know whatever it's just, yeah it's well, that it, kind of kid horror but my my like impression of like boogeyman was it was like a uh, a very like dumbed down american version of the babadook was oh, my yeah. was my I sort of that. like vibe yeah. from it um you know christmas scene is the, the the main dad in it you know the psychiatrist and david yeah. smelchin plays the Oh yeah, yeah the, the dad beginning. from the and then the you have story. Sophie Thatcher from uh, uh, Yellow Jackets, who's the, oh, yeah. effectively the lead in it. She's the eldest daughter of. She is like um, the main reason I wanted to see it because I love her in Yellow Jackets. Yeah, and and she's good. She's good, but um, it's a it's I just think an imperfect film. Um, well, it wasn't it originally. It was supposed to be like a streaming exclusive, like on Hulu, and then it I tested right. so well that they decided to release it theatrically. Yeah, which is. In fairness, the same thing that happened with Smile and Smile made a crap ton of oh, money. So really? like they were, yeah, they were going to just release it to Paramount Plus, but it tested so well that they put it oh. out theatrically and it just did gangbusters. Um, nice. uh, and, you know, 20th Century was just kind of seeing what what happened with Smile. So they thought maybe that would work for them. But, yeah, uh, I, I, you know, it's fine. It's yeah. I, I, it doesn't hold a candle to like the effectiveness, the punchiness of the short story. Yeah. Um, and because that's the that's the thing that I think is the hardest with Stephen King is he's so good at describing stuff and yeah. also so good at, at showing characters reading stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I think one of my favorite parts in the book, The Shining, is when Jack finds all of the history of the Overlook Hotel mm -hmm. and like all, you know, who it passed from, like, you know, the, the mafia was involved and in all this stuff and just like all of the um, death and and, you know horrible uh atrocities that happened in the hotel after a certain point and all this stuff and i was like yeah. oh, man, i love all that stuff like that kind of like the context history of scary places i yeah and that's so hard to convey in a film yeah and, and the same thing with the boogeyman short story is like it's a guy telling you this horrible thing that happened to him mm -hmm. but then having just seeing it outright just isn't as effective to me like i don't no. know well, it's, it's, I think it's similar with like Salem's Lot as well, because like you said too, like yeah. with like the the 
uh, TV movie is like in the novel, like it's a very slow burn movie too, but it's like this sort of like unraveling of like what is going on in this town. And it's so well done in, in Mm -hmm. King's writing, but it's like, yeah, it's like, I I feel like a lot of people have trouble translating that to, to screen. Mm -hmm. Um, That's why I'm I'm really excited. I want to see this new Salem slot movie. We were talking about it before we recorded, but it's just like, I think it's supposed to come out in like 2022 originally before yeah. the discovery merger. And then now it's just been like on an, on an indefinite hold. And I, I really want to see it because I love Salem slot. Yeah, man. It's, it's definitely, I mean, um, yeah, it went into production in 2021 and it just keeps getting pushed and pushed and pushed. Additional photography occurred in uh, May or mm-hmm. May and June of 22 and we still don't have a release date for it. Yeah. So it's very strange. So I think, um, yeah. yeah, it's like it was, uh, I think I mentioned before this too, it's like I remember at one point they like put out uh, a new version of the novel that had like, mm-hmm. you know, like whatever, like a movie's coming out of a, of a book. They like usually release a, a special version of it that has like the poster or whatever and says soon to be a major motion picture. They did that like in 2022. Yeah. And so it's just like, where is it? Where is it, David Zaslav? Yeah, what have you done to it? And it was, you know, it's produced by James Wan. Uh, yeah. Gary Doberman, Dauberman is the director of it. And he did Annabelle, Annabelle. and Annabelle Creation. And, <laughs> and the nun. And Annabelle comes and the home. Nun. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this guy's the nun, the, the Annabelle <laughs> guy. Uh, this guy's the nun is what I just said. And that's not what I meant. He did co he was one of he was the writer on it in it chapter two. Oh, that's true. So, that's true. You know. So he gets he gets the he gets uh, it. Dude, this guy gets it. Um, but I do really want to see it. I think like <laughs> you know, having the and it's very much it it speaks to the time <laughs> because uh when this was announced in which you know, uh Pilu Osbok uh, who played? Who's the Danish actor who played Euron Greyjoy on Game of Thrones? He's he's oh. supposed to be in it. He's playing uh, the, the vampire, I believe, um, or, uh, or the, the vampire's um, familiar, familiar, or is um, that right? Um, and that was very much like, a, oh, he's really hot, hot shit off of this show, uh, these last two seasons of the show, and then like in the time because he's also got a very very tiny part in the second Aquaman movie, which just came out. Oh. Um, and I was like, wow, his stuff got cut out. And it's like, oh yeah, it's because a, because that movie got sh- you know, moved around a million times, but it's like, well now he's not a draw. So like, or he's not, you know, so that he, like there's one scene of him that looks like himself in, in Aquaman too. And the rest of the time I didn't even realize it was him. Cause he's like the monster, you know, he's yeah, like yeah. the monster bad guy. Uh... Um, Huh. Uh, anyway, I just find that I, I find that kind of stuff really interesting. Um, oh, yeah. I was just like looking at the cast list for it, too. And it's like, yeah, like the guy, uh, Lewis Pullman, who's who plays the lead, Ben Mears, uh, like, you know, at the time uh, was in like The Strangers Pray by Night and Bad Times of the El Royale. And then yeah. was in Top Gun Maverick. Right. But uh, I don't know what he is. It doesn't seem like he's, he's as, uh, a lot of a commodity. Yeah, this will be. I mean, you know, they didn't have like names to go no. with other than Bill Skarsgård to go with um, it. it, and so they kind of well, they did. They had a Stranger Things kid. <laughs> I, I guess that, I guess that's true. I guess that's true. He had fame, and he was he was hot. He was yeah. uh, his star was rising. Stranger Things kid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Stranger Things kid. I don't remember your name. I mean, how do you, how do you forget the name of Finn Wolfhard? Wolfhard, that's how did I forget that name? Um, it sounds fake. It uh, does. So it sounds like somebody asked him. Somebody just found a person. Hey, what's your name? Uh, Finn Wolfhard. <laughs> what? That can't be your name. Hey. No, it's my name. I'm going to be a rock star. Yeah, that does, that does sound like a, a rock star stage name. Um, His real name's Nathaniel Schnurpus. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, so there's a million um, uh, King things coming up yeah. that are TBA, and they it, some of them have directors, some of them don't. So you have Sam's Lot, which we already mentioned, Billy Summers, which is a like literally the book came out in 2021, 
Uh, yeah. Warner Brothers just optioned it. There's gonna there's gonna be a supposedly we'll see a remake of Christine directed by Brian Fuller. We'll see if that happens. <laughs> um elevation is another like it's a 2020 or 2018 um king novel that's been adapted or, or optioned rather yeah. fairy tale um that's which one of his is, new one i think it just came out like a, last year yep uh paul greengrass is supposed to direct that one oh, really? um interesting yeah. uh, from a buick 8 which they've tried a million times i yeah. feel like to 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 adapt that one super uh, a supernatural car another one with a supernatural car um Oh Jim God. Nickel is supposed to direct that one, and he uh, directed Stakeland is probably the thing that uh, that that uh, vampire like road movie or whatever. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, different from uh, the, the vampire girl... plane movie. <laughs> Much different from that. Uh, the girl who loved Tom Gordon, which was a ni- uh, nineteen ninety nine novel, um, is supposed to be directed by Lynn Ramsey. We'll see if that happens. I love <laughs> Lynn Ramsey. Um, she's never met me. I, I admire her work is what I should say. Uh, the life of Chuck, as we mentioned is Mike Flanagan. There's yeah. also supposed to be, uh, the little green God of agony, which was a, a short story from 2011, uh, that Lionsgate has the rights to the running man is getting a remake with Edgar Wright, supposedly directing, uh, throttle, which is a 2009 novella that he wrote, uh, King wrote with his son, Joe Hill, um, which HBO max is supposedly making. We'll see again. And then uh, the long walk, uh, nice. which was a, a very old. It was a Richard Bachman. That's how old yeah. it is. Uh, yeah. A short story, uh, no full full length novel, but written by Richard Bachman, which um, yeah. Francis Lawrence, who directed the uh, the latter um, uh, Hunger Games movies, and also I Am Legend, is supposedly directed, oh. and also Constantine. I think Constantine's quite a good movie. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah. yeah. It's wild. It's yeah. wild to think about. Um, well, I just remember too is um, Welcome to Dairy. Is uh, I think they pushed it to next year, but it was originally supposed to come out this year. The HBO Max series that's uh, like a prequel, I think. Oh, to for, okay, for, uh, yeah. For it, which I am excited about. I I do love like one of my favorite things about the novel uh, of it is like how it really like the the sort of like uh, interlude chapters where it kind of goes into. Uh, like the history more of dairy um, mm-hmm. and like how, cause you know, obviously uh, Pennywise has been terrorizing uh, this, this region for uh, centuries. Um, and so uh, I'm very curious. I, I know they like, they have like some footage of it in the, like uh, at the end of last year, whenever they like put out their like sort of scissor reel for 2024. Um, and I'm very, I'm, I'm curious about uh, welcome to dairy. Yeah, I f- I'd forgotten that that was even coming out, um, which is, you know, yeah. just testament to how much they just make from him all the time. And like, yeah, there's uh, there was a uh, chapel weight was a was a short story or a, uh, a short television series that's sort of based on like, oh. the short story Jerusalem's Lot, which is a prequel. To oh, that, yeah, yeah, Sam's yeah. Lot. Um, yeah. They made another The Stand. Uh, there's the outsider, which is based on one of I his, did um, not like the HBO series. The book is, good. I was, I was very like confused. Like what are, what is it? Like, cause I know that the character of, um, Holly Gibney is not a supernatural detective by any means. So yeah. it was an in- interesting choice to like make these kind of series of kind of dark crime novels. <laughs> Let's make the one that has. A supernatural element yeah. to it or whatever yeah uh, it's a very yeah weird sort of uh novel to yeah i don't know i, I like the novel a lot but yeah mm. i was not a was not a huge fan of the, the hbo show yeah i i wanted to like it more than i did i yeah. thought it had a really interesting premise and then it was just like meh, kind yeah, of like kind the first episode is, is great where it's like really yeah. following the novel and then yeah it kind of goes off the rails fast um, there's been a million sequels to Children of the Corn. There's been several sequels <laughs> to Carrie, and sometimes they come back and just like oh, just Pet Cemetery Two. Pet is Cemetery Two fantastic. is another Mary Lambert movie. <laughs> um, uh, that's got mother effing Clancy Brown in it. Yes, yes. Uh, also, oh. have you ever seen the A Return to Salem's Lot? No, which, no, I have not written and directed by larry cohen it is just so bad and it's like <laughs> is it trying to be funny or is it just unintentionally funny it's one of those but oh, it was made no. in the 
the late eighties. Uh. Um, it's not good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I love the fact that, I mean, we obviously there's so much Stephen King media to, to talk about, you know, yeah. and we haven't even touched on some of it. And, and like what, you know, there's a whole creep show show on yeah. shutter that you can watch. And not yeah. and some of it is actually directly, you know, um, taken from Stephen King stories. Uh, the rest is not based on King, but yeah. Um, I mean, gray like, matter and survivor type are both really good. Um, oh, I need to watch the new show. King episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they made know, uh, Mr. Harrigan's phone. I, I just realized I was like looking at this list. I'm like, oh yeah, Netflix put that out. Cause I, I remember reading that short story and it's like, it's a fine short story, but again, it's one of those where I'm like, how are you, how do you make this into a, a feature length film? Uh, what is that? Where is I've that? yet to watch it. It's like, I mean, it was fine. It was a fine short story. It's in one of his, uh, in his collections that came out in 2020, I think mm. 2020, 2020, 20. I think it was 2020. Uh, but yeah, it was like the the short story is like this kid who befriends like an older man and like buys him an iPhone. Uh, then when cool. the old man dies, uh, he uh, starts getting calls from the phone uh, and like his bully gets murdered or, or something. And uh, yeah. <laughs> okay it's, it's, it's fine but yeah I, I i saw it came out on netflix last year and i'm like i or i guess two years ago um i have not watched it but i again it's just like some of these short stories it's like yeah sure it's a fine short story but like how do you how do you make this into a movie uh yeah <laughs> uh yeah how do you um and sometimes you don't and that's yeah. that's the answer maybe that's uh, sometimes that is better <laughs> <laughs> and i think that that is a perfect place to leave off. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we love Stephen King. You know, share, uh, write us an email uh, at uh, laserfocus at nerdist dot com. Uh, tell us what your favorite Stephen King adaptation is, either film or television or both. Um, I, I like the fact that we're in a world where they keep making Stephen King stuff and he keeps yeah. writing stuff, and it's just because he's so influential. Like I, I, I cannot think of a, another author. Maybe you're getting closer with like George RR R. Martin just because of the success of game of Thrones, but nobody's yeah. going back and reading. Not nobody. He's had, he's written a ton of other stuff. Yeah. Martin has, but like, um, if it's not in the Westeros, people actually kind of don't care that much yeah. about it. Um, uh, whereas King, like just all right. the time, people are at least interested in it, whether, yeah. whether they, you know, under the dome is like a flawed television series, yeah. but they still did it and they still keep making these things um, based I mean, on like, his work. How many novels has King written in the time it's taken? <laughs> oh, there's this next book. I know there's that, there's that video you can find where there's like an interview between King and, uh, or, or it's just, maybe it's just a panel between King and Martin where King is talking about how, like his writing process and stuff yeah. like that. And George R. R. Martin literally just goes, how do you write that much? <laughs> like, and it's just so funny. Cause yeah, King writes, whether the, I mean it's maybe not amazing every single time, but he writes and puts out so much stuff. Yeah, and our our friend George, I've never met George. Um, he just he keeps like he keeps having to put out statements like I am still working on the book, and I know I'm yeah. not close to death. Please don't worry. <laughs> like, and that's not a good sign. <laughs> no, we have to assure people that you are are not at death's door, or will or will live long enough to finish. That's, uh, yeah, not, yeah. not so, going mean, to be good for your self-esteem. Um, okay. um, if you had, uh, a, an off one off the beaten path, um, uh, either film or TV movie or something like that to recommend to people to watch one. That's not like a, of the main, like top five that generally people talk about what, what one uh, would you recommend to people? Oh, of a, of a Stephen King. Um, of a, sorry. Of a Stephen King. Yeah. Of Stephen King. Um, Oh, uh, probably I'm sell. Sure. Just kidding. That movie's not good. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. Like, I mean, like I've been rattling off so many. Um, I, I mean, know. Yeah. Like I said, In Fall Grass is one that I feel like mm. I don't hear many people talking about, but I, I enjoyed. I think it's really interesting. Uh, kind of trippy Netflix one. Um, you know that or or Gerald's Game. Gerald's Game is absolutely yeah. like one of my top five Stephen King adaptations um this was my bad for not mentioning it uh 
earlier, I just kind of glazed over it, but um, I'm going to say the 1985 film Silver Bullet. Everybody should watch oh, that one. Oh, Silver Bullet. I just yes. rewatched that uh, uh, the Halloween season. That was actually, Cycle of the Werewolf was the first King novel I ever read. It's a very short oh. novel. And I read it because it was, you know, in my high school uh, library. And yeah. It had like really great Bernie Wrights and illustrations. Um, but that movie rocks. Um, I don't care what anybody says. I think it's actually great. It's got an excellent Gary Busey performance. It's got a really oh, good Corey Haynes performance. That's right. Um, and uh, Megan Fellows from uh, uh, Anne of Green Gables hmm. uh, is is the other person in it. And also Everett McGill. And I mean, it's just got a great cast yeah. of like faces. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, or, or Pet, uh, Pet Cemetery 2 is the other one I would say. It's like Pet Cemetery 2. It's not necessarily, but I don't know. I love, like, I, I love Pet Cemetery and I love Pet Cemetery 2. It's so 90s. <laughs> With Eddie Furlong. Who's the dad in that one? Is there a dad? Uh, I think that is, uh, uh, oh my God. Um, the dad is, uh, Fancy. Boy's the stepdad. The stepdad, that's right. Yeah. I just remember that shot of him with like gunk coming out of his mouth. Yeah, after he gets brought back. Yeah. Yeah. I just remember like uh because like I I had a my sister's like best friend growing up was her whole family were like huge Stephen King out of or uh, Stephen King fans. And so Mm -hmm. like usually whenever they would have sleepovers, her and her friend would watch Stephen King movies and occasionally I would like sneak in and like watch part of it and i just remember in pet cemetery 2 there's a scene where clancy brown uh like his his stepson is being like bullied and so like uh he has like a motorbike uh and after he's been like killed and brought back or whatever he like uses the motorbike and like revs it on the kid's face um and i remember that like distinctly in my brain um (laughs) yeah um also we forgot to mention thinner anyway we're not talking about that one (laughs) I curse you, thinner. <laughs> Very dumb. Um, all right. Well, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, Ali, how can people get a hold of you on the internet? Should you chose? Should you choose to be gotten? Nope. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram. Is probably the main one. Uh, I'm at that spooky Ali on Instagram and and Threads. I guess I don't post anything on there. But uh, and, and nor am I on on X. But uh, you can find me on on Instagram and and the occasional nerdist uh, thing on the YouTubes and uh, wherever fine Stephen King novels are sold. <laughs> yeah, you just stand in bookstores. <laughs> You'll find King me in section. the Stephen King section. <laughs> um, she's here. She's here. That's when people go to the store. <laughs> you go to different stores. <laughs> She'll be at one of them. Um. <laughs> You can follow me on Instagram if you choose at um, functional underscore nerd. You can follow me on Letterboxd at Kyle underscore Anderson. Please do that. I've been watching a lot of Jackie Chan movies lately, and those are a lot of fun. Also, January Jallo, so a lot of Jallo movies. Um, All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Allie, for being on the show, as always. uh, Thank you all for listening to Laser Focus. I'm Kyle Anderson. Join me again next time when my guest will be a different person. Bye-bye. Laser Focus is a production of Nerdist Industries and Legendary Digital Networks. It was produced, edited, and hosted by me, Kyle Anderson. For more, visit Nerdist.com. Nerdist.